Get it switched over? I think I hear it now. Very good. Thank you to our four gentlemen and four ladies for leading us in worship, on the instruments and with voices. It's good to be with you. Good to be back after a little break last week. And uh, I am actually continuing in uh, the sermon series that I started a while back going through different symbols of the Bible, a uh, series called Your Bible and You. So uh, I'm going to talk about the Bible's refining fire today. And the next week uh, will be the final on uh, this topic called the living word. The living word. So I, I hope it will be of benefit to you, of something that you can learn and continue to delve into and apply to your lives. Um, I do want to just reference this uh, if you have it. Um, it goes along both with my message today and Next week, with some additional thoughts, it has the key text that I've been using from 2 Timothy over here. Um, but then I also wanted to uh, uh, read the words of Christ, uh, the words of eternal life, where in the book of John, he says, It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and are life. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and they are life. And that will go into the living word uh, context next week, but just a good thing to kind of meditate on. And then I just want to uh, also read with you the first two quotes from um, Spirit of Prophecy from Ellen White, uh, both from the book called Counsels to Parents, teachers, and students. I think that applies to almost everybody. I think almost everybody here is either a parent, a teacher, or a student. So I, I think there's a lot of application here. And I just want to read what she says. First, the first quote says, Above all, above all, take time to read the Bible, the book of books. A daily study of the Scriptures has a sanctifying, uplifting influence upon the mind. Bind the holy volume to your heart. It will prove to you a friend and guide in perplexity. So it's almost a challenge. It, it, it's a, you know, above all, above all other things, read your Bible, study your Bible, and give God a chance to prove to you the power, the necessity, the uplifting nature of the Bible. And then just the one right under it, also from counsels to parents, teachers, and students. The ignorance that now curses the world. She wrote this over a hundred years ago. I don't think the ignorance has gotten much better since then. The ignorance that now curses the world in regard to the binding claims of the law of God is the result of the neglecting of the study of the Scriptures. Now notice this. It is Satan's studied plan to so absorb and engage the mind that God's great guidebook shall not be regarded as the book of books and that the sinner shall not be led from the path of transgression into the path of obedience. So I know I'm kind of starting right out of the gate here jumping into to this, but it, it's just so much to uh, absorb, so much to learn here. And uh, we all have heard it before. Oh, but study your Bibles. That's what Christians do. We can study it more, uh, have devotions and things like that. But I think we need reminders. I think that Satan is very effective in his studied plan of absorbing our minds and attentions. And by the way, not always with bad stuff. It doesn't have to be you know, the bad stuff that he absorbs our mind with. But if people were struggling with their minds being too absorbed in the things of the world a hundred years ago, how much easier is it for the devil to absorb our minds with other things these days? You know, I, I know a lot of believers and Christians, they can tell you a lot more about their sports team than they can tell you about the great themes of the Bible. They can tell you a lot more about Marvel characters or Star Wars. You know, you know, and I'm not saying those are evil things. But when we allow Satan's studied plan to so absorb us that we neglect or we do not take advantage of 
the Bible. And my topic today, the refining fire. The, the Bible, the fire has a lot of symbols in the Bible, but one of them is, is fire. We're holding the refining fire of God in our Bibles. Did you bring your Bibles? How many of you brought them? That's been part of my encouragement that you bring your Bibles to church. You know, I know you may have a digital Bible. Do you know at what cost and uh, challenge this Bible comes to us? And in our day and age, we have, you know, devotion, you know, daily devotions that are prepared for us. You can buy books that all you do is turn to the page and there are the verses and a nice little thought. There are apps that will send you Bible verses and reminders and, and help you study the Bible. We are inundated with access. We are inundated with opportunity that generations before did not have. And yet it's still Satan's studied plan to absorb us so that we do not engage. And if we want to survive the complications and perplexity and the confusion and deception of the days in which we live, now is the time to get more serious about having this as our daily friend and engage with it. It's a battle, friends, I know. And again, you've heard it a hundred times, but it's just worth, uh, bears repeating. You know, there's a little analogy I heard years ago. And all analogies have their limitations, so don't go too far with it. But you've probably heard it before. If there was a button that you knew that if you pushed that button every day, you would live forever, wouldn't you make every effort to push that button? Again, I... I know it, that sounds like salvation by works and, you know, simplicity. And so, I, you know, but the same idea applies. Either the Bible will keep you from sin or sin will keep you from the Bible. And when you make it your determined purpose to engage with God's Word regularly, daily, but yes, even through music, through meditation, you can put it in your car. You can have little devotions or reminders on your phone, little app reminders that throw up a, a good psalm or a proverb or a passage to be reminded of. You either engage with God's living Word and the fire that wants to refine us or the, or the devil has his way to keep it out of our thinking. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we continue on this journey of reminding ourselves and re-emphasizing the grand and great importance of cherishing and devoting ourselves to Your Word, Father. I pray that Your Spirit would be here. I pray that all other considerations, obstacles, and barriers to our mind and to our thinking would be pushed aside right now. And that in this place and in the hearing of everyone that's here, Your plan, Your Spirit, and Your Word would be heard in this place. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Toby, where are you? And I think I'm going to need one more micro microphone technician. And I see Owen arising to the challenge. How does black and red work? Are those good ones? Green, not red. We don't like red here. We don't do red. Red, red and green. We want Christmas colors. We love red and green. Very good. All right, question number one. It's not moving. <laughs> Thank you, Nicole. But I can ask you in advance. This is all about fire and the refining fire. So uh, who was it that got called by God at a burning bush? Abel put his hand right up. Who saw God as a burning bush? All right, there it is. Abel, who Moses, are you about? Moses. Turn up the red mic so we can hear him. Moses. Is the red mic on? One more time. Moses. All right, I heard him. Did you hear him? All right, he said Moses. He is correct. God called Moses through a fire, uh, and, and that was an amazing time. I'm going to go through these a little quickly. Who envisioned, now this one might challenge a few of you, who envisioned had his lips touched with a coal from the altar? Who envisioned had his lips touched 
with a coal from the altar. A, B, our children's storyteller. Uh, Isaiah. Isaiah. I was actually hoping Isaiah would be here today. I was going to include him on that, but that's okay. So Isaiah, in vision, one of the prophets. It's very interesting. I'm just going to hesitate on this story. If you remember this, Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah has this amazing vision of God in the temple. He's overwhelmed with it. And in his consternation, in his realization that he's seeing God, he makes the statement, Woe is me, for I am a man of unclean lips. It's very interesting. He doesn't say I'm a sinner or my heart has, has, has done iniquity. He says it's my lips that are the problem. That's the problem. He understands that God is calling him to be a prophet, and God says, I can take care of it. I take the coal from the fire, and I purify the lips of the prophet. So when you read the words of the prophets, when you hear the words of the prophets, is God has done something remarkable in touching those words and purifying them and refining them so that we can believe the words of the prophets are truly the words of God. That's partly what the symbolism is here with Isaiah. Who went into the heaven in a chariot of fire? Chariot of fire. Who went to heaven in a chariot of fire? Uh, she said yes, Elijah? then she said no. And she's, uh, Elijah. She's okay. I see Eric over here. Elijah. Elijah. He is right. Uh, Elijah, chariot of fire. Very interesting, very powerful moment. What were the believers doing in the upper room when flames of fire appeared on their heads? This is the New Testament now in the book of Acts. Okay, uh, They're all doing something together. Are they singing? Are they studying their Bible? They're having breakfast. What are they doing when fire came upon their heads? All right, right here. Do you want to? All right. Looks like someone in the back maybe trying to help. Oh, is that Harper? Praying. Say it again, Harper. Praying. I think she said praying. Did she say praying? Okay, you're going to get credit because I think I heard praying. <laughs> That's right. They were praying. And in that moment of prayer, God does something remarkable. The Holy Spirit appears in visible form, and there's a fire that is visibly seen above their heads. All right, last one, Owen and, and Toby. This is the last one. The Seventh-day Adventist logo is made of three objects or symbols. Can you name them? Just say one of them so we have other people that can help out. All right. They're coming. Okay. The three angels. The three angels? Well, kind of. That's kind of right, but... Well, I'll have to explain more where the three angels come in, but yeah. Uh, do you have someone over here, Owen? Well, you guys are, are being active. The oh. Bible. The Bible, okay, so you see the Bible. What's another one? Yeah? The cross. The cross, yes. And there's one more. <laughs> one more main symbol. you got the Bible, the cross, and what else? I see Andre, oh. Flames. I think I heard her. Flames. Flames, yes. <laughs> all right, that, that's all of them, okay. So the main three symbols, this is the, the registered trademark of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Um, and so it makes up these three elements that are, are prominent. But you know how symbols work and how uh, uh, dynamic they can be? Uh, it's not just the three symbols are there, but it's how they're there and how they're formed that is significant. First of all, you have the Bible, but it's an open Bible, right? Okay, It's an open Bible, and it's also the foundation. You see that? The open Bible is the foundation of the symbol. And then right at the heart, right at the center, the middle is the cross. I kind of wish the cross was a little larger and more prominent. It's possible to kind of see the symbol and not always pick out the cross immediately, but it's definitely there. All right? So the cross is the heart of our faith. It's the center of our denomination. It's right there at the middle of the Bible. And then arising up out of the Bible, rising up out of our faith and out of our convictions of the cross, is the flame of the Holy Spirit. But yes, it is true. How many flames are there? One, two, three. That is purposeful because it is a reference also to the mission of the church in the three angels' message to carry forth the gospel the flame is ascending up, which is also a symbol of the resurrection and the second coming of Christ. By the way, I'm not making this up. 
You can look up the history of the logo and all of its depictions. The colors also are symbolic. The flame is gold, as fire would be, but it's also representing, representing the purity of the faith and the refining fire of the Holy Spirit in making our faith pure, okay, in the work of God. The Bible looks green, I have to tell you. It, it's always looked green to me, but it's not. It's actually called denim blue. It's actually, the actual official color is denim blue, and the blue is supposed to represent faithfulness to God's law. And fight, you know, blue in the Bible is symbolic for obedience and following the law. And the cross, it's kind of a transparent cross, but it's technically white. Okay, the cross is white because though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though your sins be like crimson, they shall be as wool. So the white cross symbolizing forgiveness, the blue Bible with obedience, the flame. It's, it's wonderful, isn't it? I have to tell you, it's one of my favorite. I think it's a good one. I've seen a lot of logos and symbols. Some, some churches use doves and crowns, and a lot of them use all, all these other features as well. But I think it's kind of cool. But you can see the prominence of the flame. The prominence of the flame. And it's very interesting um, how fire in the Bible takes on so many different uh, meanings and messages and symbols. But there are a few incident, incident, incidents in the Bible where fire tends to be more prominent. It's all over the place. Uh, you know, We know it's all over the place in all kinds of ways. But Moses and fire seem to have a, a more higher... Uh, connection. You, you, you realize God calls Moses literally through a burning fire. Not every prophet is called that way, but Moses is. He's called through the burning bush experience. He leads Israel with a pillar of fire by night. He literally leads them with fire. Of course, it's a cloud by day, but it's a fire by night. When they come to Sinai, God appears as fire, and the law is given, literally given, through fire. You can read Deuteronomy 4 and 5 where he, Moses recites it. He says, you spoke through the fire and with the fire you wrote your words. The fire of God is what actually writes the Ten Commandments. The finger of God. The fire of God. He spoke through the fire. The fire was so prominent that the children of Israel said, Moses, we can't take it. You go talk to that consuming fire. He's called a consuming fire. So fire is very prominent in the ministry of Moses. Of course, fire when it comes to the sanctuary, the burning altar and, and incense and the, the lampstand. So fire and, and the life of Moses, very interesting. But Elijah also has a lot of fire connected to him in his ministry. Of course, the most prominent is when we first meet Elijah in 1 Kings 17. He has this contest when, with the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel. He says, look, you think your God's the true God? I think mine's the true God. We're going to have a little contest. You build an altar, you prophets of Baal, and call on your God and see if he answers by fire. I'll let you go first, all right? And when it's my turn, I'll build an altar and I'll call on my God. And of course, you all know the story. The prophets of Baal, they do all that they can to call on Baal. Nothing happens. So Elijah says, pour water on my altar, okay? Pour as much water, gallons upon gallons. Fill a trough of water all over my altar. He prays and God answers by fire and the whole thing is consumed. Rocks, water, sacrifice. God, it's, it's a tremendous moment. Mount Carmel, God answers by fire. But you also remember when, when they come to arrest um, um, Elijah in 2 Kings, his enemies are consumed by fire. This is why James and John, when they're walking with Jesus in certain cities, rejected him. They say, Jesus, should we call fire down to consume them? They're referencing what Elijah did. All right, because Elijah's enemies were consumed by fire. And then the, the final moment of Elijah's life, he is caught up in fire. A chariot of fire literally takes him. He does not experience death. The people are looking and all of a sudden he ascends to heaven in fire. A chariot of fire. So these two uh, stories, I mean, they're very significant in all the Bible. Of course, you don't get much bigger than Moses and Elijah. Lots of fire in other places, but there's some higher level of connective tissue with fire and the refining work of God in these two individuals. So the New Testament comes along, and God repeats uh, to a large degree this, this pattern of including fire. The church is called and anointed and appointed through an experience with the fire of the Holy Spirit. They're in an act. Fire is visibly upon their heads. 
Peter says, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that you're going through. So we're tried in the fire. The church is led by fire, which is both a symbol of the Holy Spirit and of Scripture as we're getting to. And the church and ultimately the world will be judged by fire. So it's obviously a very significant uh, symbol and metaphor in the Bible. And there's a thousand different ways you can look at it. But the primary story I want us to use today is from Luke 24. If you have your Bibles please turn to Luke 24. I'm not going to put it on the screen. If you brought your Bibles, you can look it up on your phones if you want. It's a story many of us are fairly familiar with. Okay? And what Jesus is going to do here is He needs to light the fire once more in His church. He knows He's about to go to heaven, and He knows that at this moment in time, the fire has gone out. All right? There's no more fire in the disciples. It's gone cold. All right, they are doubting, they are sad, they are disillusioned, and Jesus knows if his church and if his sacrifice and his mission is going to be successful, he has got to rekindle a fire in his people. And he does that with the word. He does it with the word. And we're going to take a look at that. He wants to convert their hearts, purify their faith, and consume them with the gospel, consume their spirit. All of these things are what fire does. Okay? Fire creates a chemical change. It's a permanent change. If I was to take a piece of paper and fold it, okay, that's a physical change. It can be undone. I can unfold it. But if I take that same piece of paper and burn it, you can't turn ashes back into paper. All right? He wants to create a permanent conversion, and he wants to purify and have us consume, or else the gospel will not be able to move forward. And he uses the word as the consuming or as the refining fire. Are you there in Luke 24? We are going to read this passage together. And again, I know you've probably studied this before. I I hope that it is of of benefit that we can get into it today. A little bit of just to get us into the story. Jesus died. All right. Obviously, we we know where we're at in the Gospels. But he's now resurrected. This is Sunday morning. And everyone's trying to figure out what happened. The women go to the tomb. They don't see Jesus, but angels Tell, him, tell them that Jesus is risen. All right? Uh, verse 8 of, of Luke 24, and the women remembered Jesus' words. Verse 9, and they returned from the tomb and reported all these things to the eleven and all the rest. Sometimes we invert disciple and apostle as though they're always the same people. Remember, there were a lot more than just the twelve who were disciples of Jesus Christ. Okay? So the eleven and the rest of the disciples are informed by, uh, by the women, that they went to the tomb and it was empty and angels came and spoke to them. They returned from the tomb and reported all these things to the eleven and all the rest. They were Mary and Joanna, Mary the mother of Joanna, and also the other women were telling these things to the apostles and to the others. Now verse 11. Verse 11. But these words appeared to them as nonsense. That's how my Bible says it. It appeared to them as nonsense. And they would not believe them. I I don't know how your Bible says it. It does not say they did not believe. It It doesn't say they could not believe. There's a willfulness that Luke reports here. He says they made a conscious decision to not believe. They would not believe. Do you notice that? It's very important. What they hear from the women and what they think the angels may have said, they would not believe. It was nonsense. But Peter got up, ran, he went to the tomb, looked in it, saw the linen wrappings only, went away to his home marveling at what had happened. So Peter and John, we learn from the other Gospels, they go to the tomb, they find it empty, just like the women have said, and they must have told the other disciples what they found. All right? And that's where we begin. That's kind of an introduction to the story of the disciples on the road to Emmaus. All right? They think what they've heard is nonsense, and they would not believe. Keep that with you. Jesus needs to do something about this. Or the entire great controversy is in trouble. You understand the importance of this. So verse 13, are you there? Verse 13, and behold, I just love these little things, Luke. He says, let's get to it now. The whole point of this is coming up right now. Listen, behold, pay attention. That's what it means. Behold, two of them, we're going that very day to a village named Emmaus, 
which was about seven miles from Jerusalem. How long does it take to walk seven miles? A couple hours? I mean, if you're really hustling, you can do it, you know, in a couple hours. But if you're just... and How, how fast do you walk when you're sad, by the way? You walk fast when you're sad, or do you t- tend to kind of amble? This is a couple hour journey. Wouldn't you agree? Okay? They're going to a village called Emmaus. Emmaus means hot water or warm springs. Okay? They think they're going to where there's water. They don't realize that they're about to be consumed with the fire of God. Okay? Verse 14. And they were talking with each other about all these things that had taken place. And while they were talking and discussing, Jesus Himself approaches and began traveling with them. Now, this is very common uh, in the ancient days. You wanted to travel as groups. It was safer, less chance of robbing and, and, and getting lost and everything else. So it was not unusual for strangers just to gather together to create a caravan. That would not have surprised. They would have welcomed it, actually. They're sad, they're dejected, but at least there's someone with them and, and that's okay. So this was not unusual at all. But I, I want you to understand something. No matter how many times you study this passage, there's more that can be learned. What Jesus is about to do is he is reenacting the entire Old Testament with these disciples. He begins walking with them. And verse 16 says, but their eyes were prevented. Their eyes were prevented from recognizing. You know, sometimes when I see pictures of this, they have Jesus all hooded, you know, and kind of veiled. And No, he, they, they were prevented from recognizing Jesus. This was the intended plan of God that they would not recognize Him because He wanted them to walk by faith, not by sight. They had already walked with Jesus by sight for years and not understood His plan. They'd had Him visible. We don't know how long these two, maybe they've been disciples from the very beginning, three, three and a half years. They'd been with Jesus visibly and yet at this moment of crisis and climax, they don't get it. And Jesus is trying to teach them that we need to walk by faith, not by sight, which was the whole story of the Old Testament. Walk by faith and not by sight. No one had ever seen God. And God wanted them to walk by faith and not by sight. So this whole thing is setting up a dramatic introduction and and, uh, explanation for how God expects His believers in church to operate after His resurrection. Their eyes were prevented from seeing Him. You know, and I think we, we've all been in those times where we just wish so bad we can see God's exact purpose in His plan. But throughout all, and we've talked about this before in some of my earlier sermons, no matter how many times God literally manifests Himself, it doesn't change people's ability to understand and follow Him. He wants us to walk by faith. That's always been. Sin has created a problem, a separation, and we have to listen to His Word so that we can understand it. Verse 17. He said to them, What are these words that you are exchanging with one another as you are walking? And it says, They stood still, looking sad. Jesus literally stops them in their tracks. I hear you guys talk. What, what are you guys talking about? And here they have Jesus with them. He, I, they literally have the supreme creator and redeemer of the universe right there with them. But what's their response? They're sad. They don't understand. Friends, I'm telling you, the entire story of the Bible is all in this passage. We have the Lord Jesus Christ with us right now. Whether we recognize Him or not, is there any reason to be sad? Ooh, I, got, I, I just grew up too Pentecostal for this, guys. <laughs> I miss a, 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 I got to hear something from you. Is there any reason to be sad? Now, I'm not saying, there's a time for grief. There's still challenges. There's still sin. I'm not trying to make some universal statement here. But, But you have the Lord Jesus Christ with us. Was He with them in the Old Testament? Every step of the way He was there. Uh, But they failed to recognize it. They failed to appreciate Him. What were you talking about? They stood still looking sad. Looking sad because they don't understand. Verse 18, one of them named Cleopas answered and said to Him, Are you... 
understand something here. They kind of insult Jesus. And, and it's not subtle. They basically say, are you an idiot? Are you the only one who's visiting Jerusalem and unaware of the things which have happened here in these days? It, it's a very, you know, almost aggressive stance. of Now, they're, they're sad, so I mean, when we grieve, we sometimes lash out, but they're like flabbergasted. What are you even talking about? Who, who are you? What planet are you from? Do you not understand? Now, did Jesus understand? What had been happening in Jerusalem? Did he kind of, was he involved kind of in what had happened? He was the focal point of everything. And you know, Jesus in his mercy, he knows they're grieving. He knows they're confused. He doesn't take the bait of, you know, lashing out or anything. He simply says in verse 19, what things? What things? Again, did he know what things? Why did he ask that? You ever, you ever wonder why God acts this way? Uh, why do we need to go to God with our problems? Does that ever occur to you? Why, why do I need to pray to God when I have a friend in crisis? Doesn't God know that my friend is at? What, what purpose does it serve for me to go and talk to him and say, oh God, in case you haven't heard, I have a friend in a challenge right now. Has that ever occurred? You know, why, why, if he's the king of the universe, he loves everyone, what in the world do I need to do to go and talk to him about? You know that there is something uh, therapeutic and there is something uh, uh, that binds us together when we go through our prayers with God. And he asks us to do these things. It's not that we're informing him, it's that we're joining with him in the needs and the, 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 the challenges, and it's part of the conforming of our mind that God wants us to do. So he invites them. He knows what went on. He says, now I know what happened, but I need to hear you say it. You need to hear you say it. What things? What things? And they said to him, the things about Jesus. And I, I just, he's right there. <laughs> he's right there. The things about Jesus, the Nazarene, who was a prophet. Notice the past tense. He was a prophet and he was mighty in deed and word in the sight of God and all the people. And how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to the sentence of death and crucified him. Notice, no mention of the Romans here. He totally blamed it on the blame of the Jews. It was our rulers. They did it. They crucified him. Now, verse 21. But we were hoping. Again, notice the past tense. We were, I mean, we're not hoping anymore. Our hope is that we were hoping that it was He was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, it's the third day since these things happened. Now, I want you to pay close attention to these next few parts. Verse 22. Some of the women among us amazed us. When they were at the tomb early in the morning and did not find His body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. The, the women said that the angels said. Notice that? The women said that the angels said, but they did not believe either. They thought it was nonsense. And earlier Luke said that they would not believe. The, the women said and the angels said, but we don't believe it. That's what's implied here in the passage. And verse 24, And some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it exactly as the women had said, but they did not see Him. So I want you to notice, they don't believe the women. And by inference, they don't believe the angels. And in addition, they're not even really sure they believe their friends that went to the tomb. They don't believe any of that. All they believe is that our hope is gone. We were hoping. He was a prophet. Verse 25. And Jesus said to them, O foolish men, and slow of heart to believe in all the prophets. Very interesting. Jesus does not say why didn't you believe the women? Jesus does not say, why didn't you believe the angels? 
Jesus does not say, why didn't you believe your friends? Jesus says, why didn't you believe the Bible? Now, is there anything wrong with what the women said? No. They were privileged of being that first people to hear of the, resur- was there anything, of the resurrection. Was there anything wrong with what the angels said? No, the angels were sent by God with this beautiful testimony of the resurrection. There's nothing wrong with what they said. But Jesus says, it's the prophets that you need to listen to. You need to listen to what, what has always been the plan of God. Nothing wrong with what the women said. Nothing wrong with what the angels said. But at the end of the day, this is what we are to listen to. Can angels lead us astray? Are there false angels? Did false angels try to lead, lead Jesus astray? Did, did a fallen angel lead Eve astray? Did Paul warn that the devil himself can make himself look like an angel of light? So even when an angel, from, and Paul said, if any, anyone, even an angel from heaven were to teach you a gospel other than the gospel that I've taught you, let them be a curse. Angels are fine. God uses angels. But he says here, you're supposed to trust the Bible. <clears throat> Should we listen to the women? Oh, I heard some, uh, now all of a sudden the Pentecostalism is coming out. I hear it. Yeah, oh boy, women, yeah, they never get it wrong, do they? Hmm. You know, symbolically, symbolically, women represent the church. Right? Right? We believe that the, the women is, and there are good women, there are good churches, and there are, are churches that aren't always following what God says. Should you always listen to your pastor? Whoa. That came, a li- that came a little too fast. <laughs> if I want to... okay. As long as, as everything is in alignment with this, right? If the angels speak this, it's all right. If the women are in alignment with this, we're good. But that's what Jesus is saying. He says, look, why are you struggling to believe what the prophets have said? Was it not necessary for Christ to suffer these things and to enter into His glory? And then this moment that any, I think any Bible student just salivates at the thought of, I wish I could have been there. Remember, seven miles is this walk. Seven miles. They're walking downhill to the city of warm springs or hot water. And it says in verse 27, then beginning with Moses and with all the prophets, Jesus explained to them the things concerning Himself in all the Scriptures. I'm telling you, that was a Bible study like no other. Right, Chuck? Can you imagine that moment? Now, we have no idea. I mean, it just says it in... In simple terms like that, Jesus just goes, so let's, let's start, guys. Let's go right to the beginning. We're going to go right through it. Moses and all the prophets. Okay? But you can imagine that Jesus said, didn't Noah, wasn't his message rejected by the world and only he and his family? He still prepared an ark, but everyone rejected it. And didn't Abraham, he was asked to sacrifice his son, but his son was redeemed. He came back to life, you know, because of the ram. And didn't Jacob, have a dream of the ladder that connected heaven and earth. Wasn't Joseph betrayed by his brothers and he was placed in a pit and sold into slavery? They thought he was dead forever, but he came back to them alive and was the ruler of the world. Didn't Samson give up his life to defeat the enemies of God? Wasn't David rejected by Saul, but God raised him up to be the king of Israel? Didn't Solomon tell that he was going to build a temple that would last forever? Didn't Isaiah say that there would one day be a suffering servant who the iniquities of all would be laid on him, but he would redeem those, and by our by his stripes we are healed. Didn't Jeremiah say that the pot was broken? The potter could remake. Didn't Ezekiel say that God would that the, the, the glory would depart from the temple? Didn't Daniel say that the Messiah would be cut off in the middle of the week? Didn't Zechariah say, Strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered, and they will come and say to him, What are these wounds in your hand? He will say, These are the wounds I received in the house of my friend. Didn't Malachi say, Behold, the day is coming? burning like a furnace. Therefore, remember Moses, and I send you, Elijah, to restore the hearts of the children to the fathers and the fathers to the children. Right from beginning to end. Didn't God tell you about all this? 
What a Bible study that would have been. Can you imagine how their hearts would have been churning at the revelation of the Word of God as he went through all of these stories, restoring their understanding of the plan of God. Beginning with Moses and with all the prophets, he explained to them the things concerning himself in all the Scriptures. Now, while he walked with them in their sight, they could not see it. But while he was not visible to them, while, they were, while he is trying to redeem their faith, then they can begin to understand the plan of God. Now notice this. And as they approach, verse 28, if you're still with me, and as they approach the village where they were going, he acted like he was going further. I love this. This is the same thing he does, by the way, when he walks on water. Do you remember the story? Uh, he, it says that he acted like he was passing them by, and they had to cry out to him. But again, I, I, I'm... I'm uh, trying to uh, share with you how God is really reenacting the entire Old Testament in this story. Okay, Do you have your Bibles? How are you at your sword drills? Go back to Exodus 33. Exodus 33. That's in your Old Testament, kind of toward the beginning. <laughs> Do you remember this story? Now, remember, remember what has happened here in Luke. Jesus has just grounded them on Scripture. He has just founded them on the rock. And then he acts like he's going to pass by. Now notice this. He's, uh, Exodus 33 and verse 19. And God said to Moses, remember Moses said, I want to see you. What a bold thing. Moses, I want to see you. And what did God say? It doesn't work quite that way, but here's what we're going to do. Verse 19. I myself will make all my goodness pass before you. It's going to pass. I'm going to put you in the cleft of the rock. I'm going to found you on the rock. I'm going to put you in the safety of the rock. What is the rock? Jesus said, He who hears these words of mine and does them is like a wise man who builds his house upon the rock. I'm going to put you in the rock of the safety and security of my word, and then I'm going to pass in front of you. And when I do that, I'm going to pass in front of you. I'm going to proclaim my name, the name of the Lord before you. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and show compassion to whom I will show compassion. A few verses down, chapter 34 and verse 6. Then the Lord passed in front of him and proclaimed, The Lord God, the Lord, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness and truth. He grounds him in the rock. He puts them in the safety of His Word and then He passes in front of them to reveal His nature and His love and His compassion. And only in that moment can Moses truly understand. As a matter of fact, this moment lights Moses on fire. You go to verse 29. Moses came down from Mount Sinai and as he was coming down, they did not know that the skin of his face shone because of, his, of, of them speaking to him. So when, Moses, when Aaron and all the sons of, of Israel saw Moses, behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come near him. Moses is literally lit on fire. He becomes so close to the glory of God, he shines so bright, people can't look at him because he was grounded in the rock and God passed in front of him and he got to see the revealed truth of God. Now go to 1 Kings 19. 1 Kings 19. That's right before 2 Kings. You're going to find 1 Kings there every time. Okay, there, I, I know, I'm a pastor. I know these little secrets. Okay? Took a lot of college to learn that one. 1 Kings 19. Now we're talking about Elijah. Elijah's had some fiery moments in his ministry, but he's now in a tough place. He's now doubting. Verse 11, 1 Kings 19, 11. God said to Elijah, Go forth and stand on the mountain. What is the mountain? It's the rock. It's the foundation. It's the Scriptures. It's the prophecies. It's the Word of God. Go forth and stand on the mountain. The mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord did the same thing. The Lord was passing by. He's passing by. He puts him on the mountain and then he passes by. He's not that he's ignoring him. He wants us to reach out and cry out to him. That's the same thing that happened on the boat. Jesus is walking on the water and he's passing by and he wants his children to cry out to him. 
He's passing by. A great strong wind was rending the mountain, breaking in pieces the rocks, but the Lord wasn't in the wind. And then the wind and earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And then, the afterward, and then after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a sound of gentle blowing, a whisper. And that's when uh, Elijah wraps his head with his mantle and goes out to the cave of the mountain, begins to weep in the presence of the Lord. And Elijah and his ministry are set on fire after this. Elijah is a changed man forever. Elijah is able, whenever someone comes to approach him, fire comes out and consumes them. God is doing this exact same thing in Luke 24. Jesus now, go back to Luke 24. Jesus is passing by. He just put them on the rock. He just put them in the cleft. He's just put them on the mountain. He's got a Bible study from Moses and all the prophets. He's founded them, but now he's passing by. Okay? And he invites and expects that after he has given us this knowledge, after he has given us this foundation, he wants us to cry out to him. Do you understand that that when we study our Bibles, when we wrap ourselves also with prayer and meditation, we say, God, I've got the foundation. God, I've got what you're saying, but now I need you to show me how to apply it. Now I need you to know what the next step is. He's passing by. Oh, look at the time. Only about an hour left. I'm almost done. Um, Whenever you study your Bible, every time you take this text in your hand, God is passing by. Do you understand? He takes note. He notices. When you take the sacred text in your hand and you pray and you say, God, I'm ready to see what you have for me today. God is passing by. He is with you. And He wants to see you grow and apply that to your life. So we come back to the story. Jesus is passing by. We're now in verse 29 of Luke 24. But they urged Him. They urged Him saying, Stay with us, for it's getting toward evening and the day is nearly over. So He went in and stayed with them. Jesus said, Ask and you will receive. Ask. You know, we sing the song in the hymn, Pass Me Not, O Gentle Savior. It comes from this story. And Abide With Me also. That comes from this story. They invite him in. He comes in. When they were reclining at the table with him, he took the bread and blessed it. What's another one of the symbols of the Bible? Bread. The bread of life. He took the bread and breaking it, he began giving it to them. He's just given them a whole lot of spiritual bread and now he's giving them physical bread. They still don't recognize him until now. Verse 31. And then... And then, and then, their eyes were opened. And they realized they had been misunderstanding Jesus. For years, they had been misunderstanding Jesus. But from their study of the Word and from the intervention of God, their eyes were open, and they recognized Him. And then, poof, He vanishes. Seems kind of mean, doesn't it? Wait, it's Jesus. Poof, he's gone. Again, Jesus wanted to walk by faith and not by sight. You recognize it? Okay, now it's time for me to go. I got other things to do. But did it dissuade them? Did it discourage them? They said to one another, were not our hearts burning within us? Jesus literally brings a fire into their lives through the Word. Were not our hearts set aflame? while He was speaking to us on the road and while He was explaining the Scriptures to us. And they got up that very hour. It's late. It's evening. They're tired. They're hungry. Does that matter when the fire of God is in your belly? Boy, oh, this side's done. I, I'm done over here. Does hunger and fatigue bother you when the holy fire of God is in your belly? I know those watching online are jumping up and down right now because there's a fire somewhere. It didn't matter. 
No matter how tired, no matter how hungry, they're no longer sad, they're no longer confused, they're no longer doubting and refusing to believe. A fire has been kindled in them through the... Uh, but through the revelation of Jesus opening the word to them, they cannot stop themselves. They got up that very hour, returned those seven miles uphill, by the way. I've, we've been to Jerusalem. It's a hill. you got to go quite a ways. They go uphill, they go to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and those who were with them saying, the Lord has really risen. He really is alive. He really is. They are now fully converted, purified, consumed believers in Jesus Christ. And they cannot help but tell others. And they began to relate their experiences on the road of how he was recognized by them by the breaking of bread. They don't see Jesus. They don't believe other words. But they listen to his word. They open their hearts to him. And then they are compelled to tell others about him. That is what the Word of God does to us, friends. It's a fire. It's a power. It converts. It purifies. It spreads. Is that your experience when you study the Bible? Why not? What is it that's preventing you from being set on fire when you read his Bible. Do you still get excited when you read the stories? Does your heart still filled with conviction? Are you motivated? Do you still do you see Jesus more clearly when you read the Bible? Do you recognize him when the fire is burning? It opens your eyes. Is your sadness turned to joy? I think that road down to Emmaus probably felt like it took forever. But after they knew that Jesus was alive, it probably felt like just a few moments to get back up that hill. Has your sadness been turned to joy? Too much sadness. Lord, we've we got to be different, friends. Do you feel a passion to tell others? That is the power of the refining Word of God. It doesn't just have to be a story that happened to two disciples. 2,000 years ago. It happens today. It happens today. And it can happen tomorrow. And it can happen every day you allow Jesus to pass by as you study His Word. And you cry out and you invite Him into your heart. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, what a challenge it is to break free from our defaults, from our habits, from our routines, when we have not established a regular way of interacting with Your Word. But Father, we know if we are sincere and if we are focused, that we are not alone in this journey, that You can help us to have a daily walk with experiencing this fire. And that You can show us and You can empower us to know exactly how we need to be good students of our Bible and how we should accurately handle Your Word. And Lord, help us to utilize the abundance of opportunities that we have through technology, through devotional books, through uh, commentaries, to know as much as we can about what You're teaching us in the Bible. Lord, we do not want to be like disciples who doubt, like disciples who are sad, like disciples who are without hope. We want to be filled with that refining, purifying joy and power that makes us want to tell the world that our God is alive that our God is coming soon and that this world, this world will not last forever. This world will perish in fire. But that there's a holy fire that redeems and saves and fills us with joy. Thank You, Father, for these moments that we've had. Continue to instruct and educate us. 
Help us to support one another in this endeavor. And we'll give you all the praise. In Jesus' name, Amen. Thank you for worshiping with us today. We hope that you have a wonderful rest of your Sabbath. God bless you. We will see you next week.